Good morning, everybody. We're still waiting for Professor Sachs to join us. There he is. Greetings, everybody. <laughs> okay, good. Good to see everybody. Was the midterm okay? Tough? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll find out. <laughs> You're going to go over them on Friday, right? I'll go over them on Friday. Yes, yeah, sure. Good. All right, great. We've been uh, talking about uh, markets and how they function and how they break down. And today I want to talk about one of the main questions about a market economy, and that is about the income distribution that uh, arises in a market economy. And we're going to be spending several weeks, uh, the next few weeks, really talking about uh, the distribution of well-being and income across countries in the world and within uh, the United States in particular. Uh, I'm sure all of you appreciate that the US is a country of uh, a lot of inequalities uh, many uh, few rich, many poor, uh, large gaps uh, of uh, wealth between the top and the bottom, large gaps of income between the top and the bottom of the income distribution. And we want to understand that. Where do those uh, inequalities uh, come from? Uh, are they uh, ethically, morally fine and appropriate because they reflect uh, factors in society that uh, are uh, you know, per perhaps uh, not of ethical concern or do they raise ethical questions for us? <clears throat> and for that, we have to understand the nature of the income inequality, its changes over time, how to measure it, how to assess the underlying causes, and then to think about the implications from the point of view of public policy and, and ethics. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, and so today we'll talk about definitions of income inequality, how it's measured, uh, and look at the historical evidence, both for the world as a whole, for some key measures, and also for the United States over roughly the last 50 years. And that's our, our goal today. So I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started here. So today is about inequality and the distribution of income. And it's good to ask, why do we care uh, about the distribution of income? Uh, why do we care that there are some who are rich and some who are poor or changes over time or how we measure that? And I think that there are several uh, reasons right off uh, the top why this is a very important topic. Uh, one is that when there is inequality of income and wealth and other uh, measures of material well-being, uh, that can signal serious deprivations for some part of the population, denials of their economic rights. So one reason we care about the distribution of income is that we care about the fate of the poor within an unequal society because the poor are extremely vulnerable to suffering, uh, to suffering from hunger, to suffering uh, from disease, uh, to suffering from deprivation of shelter, uh, to suffering from deprivation of uh, education uh, as an enabler of meeting uh, their human potential, of suffering from insecurity. Uh, if a bad accident happens, if they catch an episode of uh, COVID, if, there's a, un if they become unemployed, the situation for them may turn absolutely desperate. 
So we care about the distribution of income in part because we care about the situation of the poor and recognize how vulnerable the poor are to harms and to suffering. A second, we care about the distribution of income because of the other end of the income scale, the potentially excessive political and economic power of high income individuals and groups. A couple hundred Americans today have wealth of something like uh, $2 trillion. The richest 500 people in the world taken as a whole have wealth of about $8 trillion. These people are not only wealthy to say the least, but they're extremely powerful. They decide a lot of uh, the political agenda. They finance politicians. They lobby for legislation. Through their companies, they set standards, uh, such as with Facebook and Google and Amazon, about our privacy, about our, uh, the kind of information we get, and so forth. So a few uh, uh, people uh, and a small proportion of the population can have inordinate political power. How much political power depends on the institutions of government. And in the United States, we happen to have an electoral system that is financed by private money rather than by public uh, financing. And the most recent election uh, cost something uh, more than $10 billion for the campaigning of all of the national level politicians. And where did that money come from? It came from rich and powerful people, from corporations. In other words, uh, though we claim uh, that there's one person, one vote in the United States, the actual political power is highly uneven because a small proportion of the population makes a disproportionate amount of the campaign financing and lobbying, and therefore wields a disproportionate weight in our social and political life. A third reason we care about the distribution of income is that there are potentially, and I would say likely, corrosive social consequences of high inequality. When the differences of living conditions within a society are very wide, the mutual respect and trust within the society absolutely tends to weaken. The rich don't understand and lose contact with and don't care about the poor. Uh, the poor distrust uh, the rich, often for very good reason. And the amount of social trust and social cohesion in the society weakens. And when social trust diminishes the capacity to achieve pro-sociality also diminishes. Uh, we don't get the kind of cooperation we need for providing public goods or honesty in contracts or honesty in uh, personal uh, interactions. And so there's lots of evidence that society suffers when the gaps between the rich and the poor are very wide. We care about uh, extreme inequalities of income and wealth because they are indicators often of injustice. In other words, the underlying causes of that inequality can reflect racial discrimination or gender discrimination or discrimination uh, against uh, ethnic groups or discrimination against religious groups or other identified uh, groups in society. And so the distribution of income and especially the inequalities of income can be important indicators of injustice. They may also be indicators of market power, monopoly power, the ability of uh, powerful companies to jack up prices and limit the supplies of vital goods such as life-saving medicines. We care about inequality of income in part because uh, 
the situations of the well-off or the rich may give indications of how the poorer parts of society or the par poorer parts of the world can catch up uh, in their own living standards. So they may be indications of uh, ways to raise the income of groups or countries that are lagging behind. And of course, we care about the distribution of income because it provides guideposts for public policy, for the management of budgets. And one of the main purposes of budgets should be the redistribution of income from the rich to the poor to ensure that deprivation is reduced or eliminated uh, or to narrow income inequalities that reflect current or past injustices or monopoly power. And so the budget or the fiscal policy, regulatory policy and constitutional policies are all shaped by what we can learn about the distribution of income. So we'll talk about these issues for the next four weeks today about the measurement of income inequality and some of the sources. Next week about uh, the changing nature of work because the changing nature of work, especially automation and robots and artificial intelligence is a major factor in the rising income inequality in the United States. Uh, in chap in uh, the next uh, session, we'll talk about poverty. That is the crisis of extreme deprivation. Uh, many people on this planet struggle to stay alive day to day because they are so deprived of economic goods that they have no assurance of uh, enough to eat, safe water, uh, ability to uh, avoid or to cure a disease, even something as uh, straightforward as uh, curing uh, diseases from a mosquito bite, which uh, still kills hundreds of thousands of people per year from malaria, even though it's a 100% treatable disease at very low cost. Uh, so poverty is a real crisis and it exists in most parts of the world, including the United States. And it is a major cause of suffering. So we'll talk about that uh, in the third lecture from now. And then we'll talk about more generally measurements of well-being. Last week, we uh, launched the 2021 World Happiness Report, which is based on a particular measurement of well-being. And we'll discuss that and we'll discuss how income inequality relates to uh, inequality of well-being more generally. So that's where we're heading. So today we'll talk about the uh, distribution of income across countries and not only income, but other measures of well-being. And then we'll talk about the distribution of income and well-being within countries with the focus on, on the United States. So this is a, a good starting point always. We measure the size of a national economy by the market value of the goods and services produced in a given year, and that is the gross domestic product. Uh, it's not all the goods and services, it's the goods and services that are sold in the marketplace with a few imputed goods and services that are not sold in the marketplace, especially the value of uh, the homes that are owned by people with an imputed rent as if they were paying rent rather than owning their homes. But generally GDP is the market value of goods and services produced in a year. And the GDP per capita is the single, is the best simple indicator of uh, distribution of income and of material conditions more generally. So what we see on a map like this, which in this case is the gross domestic product per capita in 2017 measured in a common set of international prices is that there is a small part of the world 
that is the high income world, about one sixth of the world's population. Those are the countries in dark blue and purple. Uh, so that's the United States and Canada. It's the countries of Western Europe. It is Saudi Arabia. Uh, and then in East Asia, it is Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand. And though you can't see it, Singapore is in there as well. That's about uh, 1.2 billion people in the high income world out of nearly 8 billion people on the planet today. The countries in turquoise or light blue are the middle income countries. You can see that the middle income countries uh, are the countries, uh, almost all of Latin America is in that category. China is in that category. Russia uh, and uh, Eastern Europe is in that category. North Africa is in that category. And Southern Africa, uh, notably South Africa, uh, uh, Botswana, uh, Namibia, and Angola in that category. And that is uh, roughly uh, 5 billion people uh, in the world. And then there is the uh, poorest billion people in the world, roughly. And you can see that that's highly concentrated in uh, tropical Africa. So the part of Africa just south of the uh, North African countries, uh, that is uh, the sub-Saharan African countries, but north of the uh, Southern African countries. Uh, and that is uh, about uh, a billion people. And most of the people in uh, tropical Africa are in low income countries or some in uh, lower middle income countries. But you can see the world is very, very uh, uneven in the distribution of income. And measured in these international dollars, per capita income differs by uh, roughly a factor of 50 between the high income world at $50,000 per person per year and $1,000 per person per year in the low income countries. If we uh, went back to 1950, which is here, uh, the world was uh, a little bit uh, simpler still a huge gap, but this time there were the rich countries, mainly uh, the US, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. And then almost all the rest of the world was still quite poor. So between 1950 and, 19, and, and 2021 or 2017 in this particular map, what has happened is that a significant number of countries that were uh, non-industrial in 1950 at the end of World War II industrialized and became middle-income countries. Some progress and in a way some narrowing of the overall income inequality in the world, though with a certain part of the world really left behind so far, and that is uh, much of tropical Africa and also a few places uh, in other parts of the world, such as Afghanistan, which you can see as the uh, country uh, in red, in, I mean, in yellow. Um, if you go India and then you go uh, to the Northwest, that's Pakistan. And then next is uh, Afghanistan. Uh, and so basically some of the world narrowed the income gaps. Uh, some of the world remained stuck far behind. The gaps between the richest and the poorest countries therefore widened from 1950 onward, but overall income inequality narrowed a bit because of the catching up of some major parts of the world, such as China. We could look at different measures of inequality of material well being. And I think that a crucial Perhaps even better summary statistic of overall well being is life expectancy at birth by country. The number of years uh, statistically and 
uh, a person lives within a society on average at birth. Uh, and in the United States as of 2015, and still today, life expectancy is about 79 years. Uh, in Canada, higher, uh, 82 years uh, shown here in this global map. Uh, what you can see is, again, a relatively small part of the world that has the best conditions of life expectancy. In this case, the United States doesn't qualify for the top category, which is countries with life expectancy of 80 or above, but Canada and Western Europe all have life expectancy 80 and above. So do Australia and New Zealand. So do Japan and Korea. So again, a strong overlap with per capita income, though the United States really uh, strangely and sadly and illustratively uh, lags many years behind other countries on life expectancy, though not on income per capita. And the reason is we're not as healthy uh, as we are wealthy in the United States, partly because of inequalities within the health of the population and partly because generalized uh, crises like obesity in the United States, uh, which also have a, a, an inequality dimension to it, but is a quite high prevalence in the United States. Well, again, one can see three categories in the world in this map. Uh, you can see the uh, highest performing countries. You can see the middle performing countries in green. They are countries with life expectancy of 70 or older. Uh, and then you can see the lagging countries uh, with life expectancy below 70 years. And the countries in orange, which again are in tropical Africa, have the lowest life expectancy in the world below 60 years. So this map is not so different from the GDP per capita map. <laughs> it shows this vast inequality of another dimension and a crucial dimension of well-being, which is longevity. Here again, there have been changes since 1950 and by and large changes for the better. If we look back in 1950, again, there was a small part of the world with life expectancy in the mid 60s and higher. That was the United States and Canada and Western Europe and Australia and New Zealand. But then much of the world had life expectancy below 60 and some parts of the world had life expectancy below 40 years. Those are the countries in red on the map. I think if you compare carefully the life expectancy in 1950 with the life expectancy in 2015, you can see that there's been a huge improvement everywhere in the world in longevity. And by and large, the poorer countries in this case really narrowed the gap with the richer countries to a significant extent, though a major gap remains even now. But there's been a lot of progress in narrowing the income inequalities across, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, life expectancy inequalities across the world. <laughs> Where did these huge inequalities of income come from? Uh, in uh, the world? How do we account for that? Well, th that is the study of economic history and the study of economic development to explain why the world is so uneven in income per capita, GDP per capita that is, or in life expectancy. And uh, well, we can't go into great uh, length uh, in this course, unfortunately, on the history of economic development, I think it's very important to have a basic uh, notion of how these inequalities 
arose. And the most important point to understand about these inequalities across the world is that they were much, much smaller before the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution, which began around 1750 in England, and then really took off in England after 1800, after James Watt's steam engine, and took off in Europe after 1815, the end of the Napoleonic Wars, and took off in the United States, especially uh, after uh, the American Civil War, is a phenomenon, therefore, roughly of the last two and a half centuries. If we dial back the world economic clock to before 1750, the world was poor almost everywhere. There were gaps in per capita income between the richest and the poorest, but they were on the order of three to one, not a hundred to one. And now from the emergence of industrialization, the world became far more unequal in income distribution. Why is that? Well, by and large, from a simple uh, point of view, not explaining causation, we can say it's because industrialization took place only in a rather small part of the world during the first century and a half of industrialization. From 1750 to 1900, only Europe, the United States, uh, Australia and New Zealand to an extent, and Japan at the start industrialized. And the rest of the world remained largely agrarian and non-industrial. So from a mechanistic point of view or an accounting point of view and a historical point of view, we can say that the inequalities of in our world today were small before the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution amplified inequalities massively because a small part of the world industrialized, whereas most of the world did not industrialize. And the industrializing countries became wealthier. And those that remained as agrarian or raw material producing societies rather than as industrial economies remained at low levels of per capita income. And this timeline gives you some indication of this. It shows that back around 1800, all countries were at low GDP per capita, and then some started to rise. The United Kingdom and the United States started to rise first. Later on in uh, the second half of the 19th century, Japan began rapid economic growth. Russia began economic development at the end of the 19th century. Some parts of the world did not really uh, experience industrialization until after 1950. China is an example of that. Uh, China had very low per capita income until the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949. Industrialization then began. But if you look at the curve for China, you can see that the rise of per capita income is very recent. It's properly dated uh, actually to 1980 onward when China adopted a set of policies, market reforms, outward orientation to trade uh, and a kind of a pragmatic mixed economy between state enterprise and the private sector 
that led to very rapid industrialization in China. All of this is to say that the kinds of vast inequalities that we see in the world are relatively recent in historical terms. They are the product by and large of the industrial revolution. This then begs another question, why did industrialization take place in only a relatively small part of the world in the 19th and first half of the 20th century? And then why did it begin to spread to countries like China after 1950? The answers are very complex. And these are the main debates of development economics. But I would say that there are two kinds of answers that are given. One is that the early industrializers had certain preconditions for early industrialization, higher rates of literacy, more favorable geography, access to critical raw materials such as coal and so forth. And a second factor is geopolitical. The early industrializers not only had a rise of income, but with that rise of income came a massive rise of military power. And with the rise of military power came imperial conquests. And with imperial conquests came subjugation of a large part of the world by especially the European industrial countries. Britain, of course, became the preeminent imperial power in the 19th century. Why? Well, because it industrialized first. It turned its military into an industrial enterprise, which was then able to conquer India and able to conquer a lot of Africa and able to conquer other parts of the world. And so the British Empire was the result of this industrial, uh, the early industrialization of Britain. And my interpretation would be that the imperial rule raised the incomes of the imperial powers to some extent but it stifled industrialization in the conquered parts of the world because the imperial powers wanted their colonial possessions to provide raw materials. And they did not want an educated colonial uh, 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 society because more education in, uh, colonized uh, lands in Africa or in India and so forth would lead to demands for independence and social unrest, which indeed they eventually did. And so the imperial powers did not provide education, did not provide adequate infrastructure, did not aim to develop their colonial possessions other than as providers of raw materials. And this meant that industrialization development was delayed in those countries until they gained independence, which is a process that began after World War II. So my interpretation is early industrialization, imperial rule and domination, and then finally a new phase after roughly 1950 in which the former colonial possessions of European empires finally could begin their own path of economic development and catching up. And this, uh, I think, helps us to understand why the world is unequal today, but why some parts of the world are able to achieve very rapid economic development and technological improvement and thereby narrow the income gap with those countries that became richer earlier. So let me now turn to inequalities within countries. Countries also display gaps between the rich and the poor. These can be geographic disparities. They can be disparities uh, by other 
uh, for other reasons by race or gender uh, or uh, other uh, dimensions that are crucial. To understand how we can measure inequalities within countries, we need something more than the GDP per capita. That's an average for the country as a whole. So we have to look at ways to measure the incomes of individuals or the incomes of households or the incomes of different groups within the society. And to do that, we look at various kinds of measures of the distribution of income within the country. Probably the most used single statistic is the Gini coefficient. The Gini coefficient is a measure of inequality across uh, individuals or groups within a society. And by construction, it is a measure zero to one, zero connoting equality across the society and one denoting complete inequality. And I'll show you how that works in just a moment. Or we might look at the uh, disparities of income by looking at the income or the wealth of the top 1% of the society. Or we might look at the top decile, the income or wealth group from 90 to 100% divided by the income of the bottom decile, the poorest 10% of the society. Or we could differentiate uh, earnings or wealth or income according to race or ethnicity or gender. So there are many, many measures of inequality uh, that we'll see. Probably the most uh, frequently used measure is the Gini coefficient. And this uh, simple graph gives an explanation of the Gini coefficient. So on the left, imagine that the income of the population is divided into quintiles, into blocks of 20% of households. And imagine that the bottom 20%, the poorest 20%, has 5% of the national income. The next 20% of households, the second bottom quintile, has 10% of the income. The third quintile, the middle income, uh, has 15%, uh, yes, has 15% of uh, the national income. The uh, second from top quintile, uh, 60 to 80 percentile, has 20% of the national income. And the richest 20% of the households have half of the national income, okay? So that is an unequal society because full equality would mean that each quintile has exactly 20% of the total. The bottom 20% would have 20% of the income. The top 20% would have 20% of the income in a fully equal society. But instead here, the bottom 20% have only 5% of the, of the income and the top 20% have 50% of the income, okay? So we can graph that on the right-hand curve, creating what's called a Lorentz curve. And the Lorentz curve starts at zero and goes to 100%. And it shows, starting from the poorest part of the population to the richest, the cumulative share of the income earned by the cumulative share of the population. Let me give an example. For the bottom 20%, the poorest 20% of households, they have 5% of the income. And so this is the point 5% on the Lorentz curve. If we take the bottom 40% of households, they have 5% plus 10%, they have 15% of the total income. The bottom 40% has 15%. So I go to 40% of the cumulative share of the population and the Lorentz curve is at 15% of the total national income. If I look at 60% of the population, 
I would have five plus 10 plus 15. Uh, so that would be 30% uh, of the income owned or earned by the poorest 60% of the population, this point on the Lorentz curve. If I look at the cumulative income of the poorest 80% of the population, that's five plus 10 plus 15 plus 20, that's 50% of uh, the, if I've got that right, that's 20, 30 plus 20, 50%. So the poorest 80% of the population has 50% of the income and the 100% of the population has 100% of the income, this final point on the Lorentz curve. Now, what the Gini coefficient does is measure the distance between, or the area between the Lorentz curve and a perfect equality line, the 45 degree line, in which each cumulative share of the population would have that same cumulative share of the income. And we get an area A. If we divide a by the area of this whole lower triangle, which is A plus B, we get the Gini coefficient. So in this example, the Gini coefficient is 0.4. You can see that A divided by A plus B, the area of, between the line of equality and the Lorentz curve, divided by the entire area of this triangle has to be between zero and one. If the society is perfectly equal, the Lorentz curve is simply the 45 degree line or the line of equality. There is no area between the Lorentz curve and the line of equality if the income distribution is perfectly equal in which case A is zero, B uh, has all of the area, A divided by A plus B would be a Gini coefficient of zero, full equality. On the other hand, suppose that uh, one person or 99% of the population have no income at all, and the top 1% has all of the income. Then the picture looks like this. The Lorentz curve is, uh, I didn't actually draw it properly. The Lorentz curve is uh, this bottom line, the x-axis all the way to the point, oops, all the way to the point, 0.99. And then it goes up to 100% for, because the top 1% of the population has all the income. If you do the arithmetic of the area of these, uh, of A and of B, you find out that the Gini coefficient is 0.99. So this is a case of nearly complete inequality where only 1% of the population owns all of the income. If one person in the society say Jeffrey Bezos in the future, the owner of Amazon owns everything <laughs> and all the rest of us have no income, uh, then the Gini coefficient approaches 1.0, full inequality. So the Gini coefficient is a very useful measure between zero and one of the amount of income inequality across the households of the society. And the more unequal the distribution, the larger is the area A, the area between the line of perfect equality and the Lorentz curve, because it means that the poorest part of the population has a small share of the total income. And A becomes larger relative to B, and therefore the Gini coefficient goes from uh, zero with pure equality to a value of one with total inequality, meaning one person has everything, all the rest have nothing. 
So if we look at the Gini coefficient around the world, we find something like this. Uh, we find that the United States has a Gini coefficient shown in orange. It's between 4 0.4 and 0.45. By the way, Gini is sometimes reported 0 to 100 or sometimes 0 to 1, depending whether percent or absolute number. So the US would be about 0.4 to 0.45. And South Africa is about 0.6, even more unequal. Brazil is uh, about 0.55 Gini coefficient, very unequal. And the least unequal or the most equal parts of the world are the countries of Scandinavia, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and the other North uh, European countries, the other Nordic countries, Iceland and Finland. So the five Nordic countries, Iceland, Finland, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, have Gini coefficients of between 0.25 and 0.3, very equal. The United States is a much more unequal society than the countries of Northern Europe. What can we say looking at a whole, as a whole of this picture, we can say that most of the Americas from the United States uh, down through uh, the uh, southern tip of, uh, uh, of uh, Chile and Argentina, the southern cone, are quite unequal. The Americas are quite unequal. Africa is quite unequal, especially southern Africa. Europe is rather equal, especially northern Europe. Okay. Well, here too, we would need both a historical analysis and a current policy analysis to understand these differences. Why are the Americas so unequal? Mainly because of the legacy of conquest. Uh, all of the Americas uh, are conquest societies, but especially the United States to the South are conquest societies based on slavery. Uh, so a lot of uh, Africans enslaved and a uh, impoverished African American population during the period of slavery, and then a long period of, in effect, apartheid uh, system of politics and society in the Americas, including the United States, even for the hundred years after the end of the US Civil War, left a legacy of massive income inequality. Similarly, South Africa is perhaps the most unequal place in the world because of the legacy of, uh, of uh, colonial rule, first by the Dutch and then by the British, the long apartheid rule uh, which was the system of blatant legalized uh, racism and white supremacy uh, and segregation. And because countries with uh, large mining or mineral sectors also often are quite unequal, not necessarily, but often because of the unequal ownership of, for example, the gold mines and the diamond mines in South Africa. And so it's both economic structure and history, which explains part of the income inequality. And then public policy makes a difference because what I am showing you here is not the earnings of households in the, their market earnings, but the income of households after they pay taxes and after they receive transfer payments from government, so what's called the post-tax and transfer Gini coefficient, taking into account the redistribution that is undertaken by government. And in Northern Europe in particular, the taxes are 
a very high proportion of the national income. And then the redistribution is also a high proportion of the national income. And that tends towards equality in the society because the payment of taxes is in proportion to incomes, whereas the uh, transfer of income is in proportion to persons and often uh, with special help to the poor. And so the fiscal redistribution tends to narrow the income inequality. Now, different uh, countries have different extents of fiscal redistribution and therefore different patterns of inequality. And what's shown here is another measure of inequality. It's the share of income going to the top 1% of the population for two different groups of countries. On the left-hand side are the English-speaking countries in the Anglo-Saxon tradition of more laissez-faire economics, free market economics. And on the right-hand side are countries that tend to have more redistribution of income through government. And we can see two different trends over the period from 1900 to 2014, which is shown in this graph. In the <coughs> Anglo-Saxon <coughs> English-speaking economies, income inequality fell during the Great Depression and during World War II, but then it increased very significantly from the 1970s onward. So we get a U-shaped picture of inequality, in this case measured not by the Gini coefficient, but by the income of the top 1%. Whereas in the economies shown in the right-hand block, the income inequality did not rise the same way as it did in the English-speaking countries. And the reason is that the countries in the right-hand side with one exception that I see, uh, all have much more active redistribution of income. The one partial exception to this is uh, Japan, uh, which does not have a highly redistributionist uh, budget policy. But the others collect a lot more taxes and therefore redistribute income to a much greater extent. Here's another way to see this. On the Horizontal axis is the Gini coefficient before the household pays taxes and receives transfers. And on the vertical axis is the Gini coefficient after the payment of taxes and transfers. If there were no fiscal policy at all, the countries would align on the 45 degree line. There'd be no difference between pre-tax and post-tax Gini all of the countries are below the 45 degree line. What this means is that the tax and transfer system is reducing income inequality because it's taxing the rich more and it's giving more to the poor. And the vertical drop from the 45 degree line to the country measures the amount of redistribution of the income towards more equality in that country because it's the decline of the Gini coefficient due to taxes and transfers. One can see that the biggest declines <clears throat> in income inequality are countries that are furthest from the 45 degree line. And they are countries like Norway, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, Belgium, Germany, Whereas the United States is rather close to the 45 degree line and Mexico, Turkey, and South Korea are almost on the 45 degree line. This means that Mexico, the Mexican budget redistributes very little income. The Turkish budget redistributes very little income. The United States budget redistributes some income, but not very generously. Not as much income redistribution as in Japan or Italy or Germany or Belgium or Norway and so forth. 
So when we look at the Gini coefficient, we need to ask, are we talking about the Gini coefficient of market earnings or of post-tax and transfer earnings? And the difference is the amount of fiscal redistribution or redistribution by the budget. One reason why Europe has lower Gini coefficients post-tax and transfer is that it taxes a lot more than the United States. The US is a relatively low tax country. By this particular measure, uh, the OECD puts the US tax revenues at about 27%. Uh, in Europe, the tax revenues are typically more than 40% of GDP. So those countries tax more and they therefore redistribute income more than in the United States. So let's now hone in for the remaining 15 minutes on some trends of inequality of income within the United States. First, we've already seen that there's rising income inequality from the 1970s onward. The United States went through a period of declining inequality, especially from the 1930s to the 1960s, and then a period of rising income inequality from the 1980s onward. What happened? What happened is history and politics. Uh, the Great Depression, lowered the income going to the top of the income distribution. And the Great Depression in the United States started in 1929 and lasted until 1939 when the military buildup of the economy began. World War II further narrowed the income inequalities, partly because of price and wage controls and very high rates of taxation to help pay for the war. Then the New Deal policies of Franklin Roosevelt implemented between 1933 and 1945 were by and large carried forward by his successors, uh, by uh, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson until the middle of the 1960s. From then on, the New Deal coalition politically that supported an active government and a lot of redistribution of income fell apart. And from the 1980s onward, politics in the United States has been much less redistributionist and much more towards cutting taxes, especially for the rich, and reducing the transfer payments to the poor. Maybe something's changing with the Biden administration. This is one of the big questions now. But from Ronald Reagan onward, we had rising inequality of income, partly because of the politics of the United States changing from redistributionist to tax cutting. But since redistribution requires tax for taxes and transfers, the tax cutting era started by Ronald Reagan led to rising income inequalities, but not only because of that, other factors have been at work. We can say that not only did income become more unequal, but the ownership of wealth became more unequal as well. Wealth is not the flow of the, your earnings in a year, it's your ownership of financial assets and real assets like housing, and the share of wealth inequality has also increased. The top 1% of the wealthiest Americans is not uh, about 22% uh, of income, it's about 40% of total wealth, even more unequal than the income distribution. Again, we can see the trend of rising inequality in terms of the rise of the Gini coefficient in the United States. And this graph conveniently shows you the two different measures of the Gini coefficient. The top Gini coefficient, meaning more unequal, 
is the distribution of income across households based on market income before paying taxes and before receiving transfers. The bottom line, which mirrors rather closely the upper line, but at a lower level, uh, roughly uh, 10 to 12, 0.1 to 0.12 uh, lower in the Gini coefficient, is the Gini coefficient after paying taxes and receiving benefits from households. So we could see that by either measure, the inequality in the United States has widened over time rather considerably from the late 1970s until uh, this past decade. And the trend has uh, continued uh, uh, until now of higher income inequalities. So what are the sources of the inequality of income? Uh, there are many, and that is why this is a complex and contentious area of debate because different uh, observers attribute different reasons for the income inequality. And some of the possible sources of income inequality are the following. First, what is called the functional distribution of income, and I'll explain that in a moment. That's the distribution of income between capital and labor as a whole. Then differences of households according to age and experience, differences of households and individuals according to education, differences of households and individuals depending on the families they're born into, because parents make transfer payments and give bequests to their children. And so one reason for unequal incomes is that uh, some people have the fortune to be born into wealthier households uh, and they thereby received uh, large transfers from their parents and some were born into poor households and did not receive such transfers or bequests. Another possible source of income inequality is market power, that monopoly power not only gives the monopolist more income, but the argument is that market power has risen in America. The economy has become more monopolized over time. This is not implausible for reasons that I'll discuss in a moment. Another possible source of income inequality is racial and gender discrimination. We have large gaps in America according to race, and we have large gaps according to gender. Women earn less money in the labor market and less for comparable work. Income inequality is also affected by various kinds of shocks to the society. Uh, crises of unemployment, like during COVID-19, raised income inequality because the rich did not lose their jobs, but the poor did. Similarly, in the 2008 financial crisis, uh, there was a, a, a rising income inequality in the aftermath of that crisis. Natural disasters can raise income inequality because people lose their wealth and their jobs to floods and to hurricanes and to droughts uh, and to forest fires and so forth. And war can be a source of income inequality, fortunately, not on uh, American soil, uh, but for many countries in the world, conflict and violence is a major source of income inequality. And finally, we should mention luck because luck is a, a hugely important factor in explaining why some households do better than others. So these are some of the sources of income inequality. They pose the question, which factors explain the US income inequality and account for the rising inequality of income 
in the United States after the 1970s? Well, one possible answer is the functional income distribution. National output is earned by workers and it's earned by capital owners of various kinds and it's earned by land owners of various kinds. And the distribution of that total GDP to workers or to capital owners or to land owners collecting rent and so forth varies over time. And one of the powerful phenomena at work is that the share of the national income, uh, what I call the functional distribution of income, has shifted away from workers since the early 1980s. This is quite surprising because this uh, has tended in the past to be a fairly uh, stable measure, but the share of total output accruing to workers as earnings declined from something around 64%, almost two thirds of uh, the uh, output of the economy in 1980 to something around 58% uh, in 2016. It's not a, an overwhelming shift, but it's a very marked shift of national income. And the counterpart of this shift is rising income accruing to capital owners. So part of the redistribution is that workers as a whole became uh, less uh, 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 recipients of a smaller share of national output, whereas capital owners became recipients of a rising share. The stock market has boomed. The stock market is the returns to capital uh, or the market capitalization of the earnings of capital. And that has gone up, whereas workers' wages have remained stagnant. We'll study that next week when we talk about the changes in the world of work. But we can say that some of the possible causes are a higher share of output accruing to intellectual property, that is to the owners of patent rights. Increasing monopoly power could be another explanation. International trade with lower wage countries could be a, another explanation. All of it is to say that capital owners who tend to be richer have seen their incomes rise more than workers because of the shift of income distribution. Another aspect of income inequality requires us to look at the timing uh, of income within a household. And the idea is that older people will be wealthier than younger people in general, because they have had time during their lifetime to save, accumulate financial wealth, and therefore prepare for retirement years. And the idea of the life cycle analysis is to say that young households borrow for the future, middle-aged households save for retirement, and older households run down their wealth uh, during retirement years. And so the wealth profile during the age of the household looks something like the bottom line. Young people can start out with some wealth because of an inheritance, but then they go into negative wealth to borrow for school or for a home or for a car or something else. And then reaching uh, age 30, households, uh, individuals start to save for the future. They build up wealth over time, and then they decrease the wealth during retirement years, often uh, dying with uh, a certain positive wealth at the end, either because they were saving to make sure, not knowing uh, the age of death, uh, precautionary saving, or because they were planning to give a bequest to their children or to others. But this means that whenever we look at income distribution, we need to adjust for age. Not to say that the changing age distribution explains that much of the changing income inequality, but distribution of income according to age makes a big difference. 
Another reason for the widening income inequalities is that within the world of work, there has been a rising gap between the earnings of people with uh, college degrees and higher and those without college degrees. We talked about that briefly. We're going to talk about that more next week. But this means that the gap of earnings between those with high educational attainments and lower educational attainments has widened. And there is a big lifetime difference of earnings according to the uh, attainment of education on average. So those with professional degrees have lifetime earnings estimated by this study at about $3.6 million over the lifetime, whereas those with a high school diploma, uh, $1.3 million over the lifetime. So educational gaps explain uh, a big and widening part of the income inequalities. Race, racial gaps also explain a lot. Part of that is differences of educational attainment. And a lot of that relates to history. Uh, it relates to the impoverishment and discrimination faced by uh, Black uh, households in American society, uh, the difficulties of uh, non-white populations in general. Uh, and uh, we see a continuing gap, especially for Black and Hispanic households. And part of that is a reflection of uh, past history and ongoing discrimination and differences related to that uh, and to other factors of educational attainment. Final point I wanna make is that there is a relationship between income inequality and social mobility. And it's sometimes these days called the Great Gatsby Curve uh, after the novel, uh, Great Gatsby, uh, which is a novel about inequalities of income over time. So if on the horizontal axis, I plot the Gini coefficient, and on the vertical axis, we measure the extent of uh, social mobility with a higher score, meaning lower social mobility, because it's measured as the correlation of the parent's income with the children's income. So how much do the children replicate the class situation of their parents? And if that score is high, it means low social mobility. We see a strong evidence that countries with more inequality across households have less social mobility across generations. So this is a very important idea. Countries that are highly unequal have less intergenerational mobility. You can see three, four very unequal countries as shown on the right-hand side, Argentina, Chile, Brazil, and Peru. And the children in those countries have uh, incomes very much like their parents. Whereas on the bottom uh, left of this graph, Norway, Finland, Denmark, Sweden, the Nordic countries, they have very low levels of income inequality and very low uh, correlation of parental and children's incomes. In other words, high intergenerational mobility. Very important point. The United States in this graph is in the middle, rather high income inequality, rather low intergenerational social mobility, at least for the United States compared with the higher income countries of Europe. All of that is to say that when there is income inequality within a generation, there's a good chance that it's going to be replicated across generations because children of poor households have a harder time making it than children of wealthier households face it. The children of wealthier households have their schooling paid for them. They have other benefits. They receive bequests. Whereas the children of poor households have to make it on their own by and large in American society. But in more equal countries with more active fiscal redistribution, 
the children of poor households are helped because they get free tuition, they get other benefits, uh, their families get more transfer payments. And so the intergenerational mobility is higher. We will pause here because we're gonna continue this topic at length for the coming three lectures. Next time we're going to be talking about the world of work uh, and how it's changing and how it's widening the income inequalities. Then we'll be talking about poverty and uh, the burdens of poverty and the ways to end poverty. And then we'll be talking about measuring well being generally and how to increase overall well being. So that's our roadmap for the coming weeks. Thanks, everybody, and see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks. See you on Friday.